Side 3 Chapter 4 The Evidence of the American Lady Mrs. Hubbard arrived in the dining car in such a state of breathless excitement that she was hardly able to articulate her words. Now, just tell me this. Who's in authority here? I've got some very important information, very important indeed, and I just want to tell it to someone in authority as soon as may be. Now, if you gentlemen... Um... Her wavering glance fluctuated between the three men. Poirot leaned forward. Uh, tell it to me, madame, he said. But first, pray, be seated. Mrs. Hubbard plumped heavily down onto the seat opposite to him. Now, what I've got to tell you is just this. There was a murder on the train last night, and the murderer was right there in my compartment. She paused to give dramatic emphasis to her words. You are sure of this, madame? Of course I'm sure. Oh, the idea. I, I, I know what I'm talking about. I'll tell you just everything there is to tell. I'd gotten into bed and gone to sleep, and suddenly I woke up, and all in the dark it was. And I knew there was a man in my compartment. I was just so scared I couldn't scream, if you know what I mean. I just lay there and thought, mercy, I'm going to be killed. I just can't describe to you how I felt. All oh, these nasty trains, I thought, and all the outrages I'd read of. And I thought, well, anyway, he won't get my jewellery, because, you see, I'd put that in a stocking and hidden it under my pillow, which isn't so mighty comfortable. Oh, by the way, kind of bumpy, if you know what I mean. But that's neither here nor there. Now, um, where was I? Uh, you, you realized, madame, that there was a man in your compartment. Yes, well, I just lay there with my eyes closed, and I thought, whatever should I do? And I thought, well, I'm just thankful that my daughter doesn't know the plight I'm in. And then somehow, well, I got my wits about me, and I felt about with my hand, and I pressed the bell for the conductor. I pressed it, and I pressed it, but nothing happened, and I can tell you, I thought my heart was going to stop beating. Mercy, I said to myself, maybe they've murdered every single soul on the train. <sighs> it was at a standstill, anyhow. And a nasty, quiet feel in the air. But I just went on pressing that bell, and oh, oh, the relief, when I heard footsteps coming running down the corridor, and a knock on the door. Come in, I screamed, and I switched on the lights at the same time, and would you believe it, there wasn't a soul there. This seemed to Mrs. Hubbard to be a dramatic climax rather than an anti-climax. And what happened next, madame? Well, why, I told the man what had happened, and he didn't seem to believe me. Seemed to imagine I'd dreamt the whole thing. Well, I made him look under the seat, though he said there wasn't room for a man to squeeze himself in there. But it was plain enough that the man had got away, but there had been a man there. And it just made me mad the way the conductor tried to soothe me down. Uh, now, I'm not one to imagine things, mister. Um, but I, I, I don't think I know your name. Uh, Poirot, madame. And this is Monsieur Bouc, a director of the company, and Dr. Constantine. Mrs. Hubbard murmured, oh, 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 yeah, pleased to meet you, I'm sure, uh, to all the three men in an abstracted manner, and then plunged once more into her recital. Now, I'm just not going to pretend I was as bright as I might have been. I got it into my head that it was the man from next door. You know, the poor fellow who'd been killed. Well, anyway, I told the conductor to look at the door between the compartments, and sure enough, it wasn't bolted. Well... I soon saw that. I told him to bolt it then and there, and after he'd gone out, I got up and put a suitcase against it to make sure. Now, what time was this, Miss Isabel? Well, I, I'm sure I can't tell you. I never looked to see. I was so upset. And what is your theory now? Why, well, I should say it was just as plain as plain could be. The man in my compartment was the murderer. Who else could he be? And you think he went back into the adjoining compartment? Well, how do I know where he went? I had my eyes tied shut. Well, he must have slipped out through the door into the corridor. Well, I, I couldn't say. You see, I had my eyes tied shut. <sighs> Mrs. Hubbard sighed convulsively. Mercy, I was scared. If my daughter only knew. You do not think, madame that what you heard was the noise of someone moving about next door in the murdered man's compartment? No, I do not, Mr... Uh, what is it? Uh, oh, yeah, uh, Poirot. The man was right there in the same compartment with me. And what's more, I've got proof of it. Triumphantly, she hauled a large handbag into view and proceeded to burrow in its interior.
She took out in turn two large clean handkerchiefs, a pair of horn-rimmed glasses, a bottle of aspirin, a packet of Glober's salts, a celluloid tube of bright green peppermints, a bunch of keys, a pair of scissors, a book of American Express checks, a snapshot of an extraordinarily plain-looking child, some letters, five strings of pseudo-oriental beads, and a small metal object, a button. What now? You see this button? Well, it's not one of my buttons. It, well, it's not off anything I've got. I found it this morning when I got up. As she placed it on the table, Monsieur Bouc leaned forward and gave an exclamation. But this is a button from the tunic of a wagon lit attendant. Well, there must be a natural explanation for that," said Poirot. He turned gently to the lady. This button, Madame, may have dropped from the conductor's uniform, either when he searched your cabin or when he was making the bed up last night. I just don't know what's the matter with all you people. It seems as though you don't do anything but make objections. Now listen here. I was reading a magazine last night before I went to sleep. Before I turned the light out, I placed that magazine on the little case that was standing on the floor near the window. Have you got that? They assured her that they had. Very well then. The conductor looked under the seat from near the door, and then he came in and bolted the door between me and the next compartment. But he never went up near the window. Well, this morning that button was lying right on top of the magazine. Now, what do you call that? I should like to know. That, Madame, I call evidence," said Poirot. The answer seemed to appease the lady. "Yeah, well, it makes me madder than a hornet to be disbelieved," she explained. "Now you have given us most interesting and valuable evidence," said Poirot soothingly. "Now, may I ask you a few questions?" "But why willingly?" How was it, since you were nervous of this man, Ratchet, that you hadn't already bolted the door between the compartments? I had," returned Mrs. Hubbard promptly. "Oh, you had? Well, as a matter of fact, I asked that Swedish creature, pleasant soul, if it was bolted, and she said it was. And how was it you couldn't see for yourself? Because I was in bed, and my sponge bag was hanging on the door handle." And what time was it when you asked her to do this for you? Well, now let me think. It must have been around about half past ten or quarter to eleven. She had come along to see if I'd got an aspirin. Well, I told her where to find it, and well, she got it out of my grip. You yourself were in bed. Yes. <laughs> Suddenly she laughed. Oh, poor soul! She was in quite a taking. You see, she had opened the door of the next compartment by mistake. Monsieur Ratchets, yes.、Uh, you know how difficult it is as you come along the train and all the doors are shut. She opened his by mistake, and she was very distressed about it. He'd laughed, it seemed, and I fancy he may have said something not quite nice. Well, poor thing, she was all in a flutter. Oh, I make mistake, she said. <laughs> I am ashamed to make mistake. Not nice man, she said. He say you too old. Doctor Constantine sniggered, and Mrs. Hubbard immediately froze him with a glance. He wasn't a nice kind of man, she said, to say such things like that to a lady, and it's not right to laugh at such things. Doctor Constantine hastily apologized. Now, did you hear any noise from Monsieur Ratchet's compartment after that? Asked Poirot. Well, not exactly. Oh, what do you mean by that, Madame? Well, she paused. He snored. Ah, he snored, did he? Terribly. The night before, he quite kept me awake. Ah,、uh, you didn't hear him snore after you had had the scare about a man being in your compartment. Why, Mister Poirot? How could I? He was dead. Ah,、oh, yes, truly," said Poirot. He appeared confused. Do you remember the affair of the Armstrong kidnapping, Mrs. Hubbard? He asked. Well, yes, indeed I do. And how the wretch that did it escaped scot-free. My, I'd have liked to get my hands on him.
Well, he has not escaped. He is dead. He died last night. You don't mean... Mrs. Hubbard half rose from her chair in excitement. Uh, but yes, I do. Ratchet was the man. Well, well, to think of that. I must write and tell my daughter. Now, didn't I tell you last night that that man had an evil face? Well, I was right. You see, my daughter always says when Mama's got a hunch, you can bet your bottom dollar it's okay. Uh, were you acquainted with any of the Armstrong family, Mrs. Hubbard? Uh, no. Now, they moved in a very exclusive circle, but I've always heard that Mrs. Armstrong was a perfectly lovely woman and that her husband worshipped her. Well, Mrs. Hubbard, you have helped us very much, very much indeed. Perhaps you will give me your full name? Uh, why, why, certainly. Uh, Caroline Martha Hubbard. Uh, will you write your address down here? Mrs. Hubbard did so without ceasing to speak. I just can't get over it, Cassetti, on this train. Why, well, I had a hunch about that man, didn't I, Mr. Poirot? Uh, yes, indeed, madame. Oh, by the way, have you a scarlet silk dressing gown? Mercy, what an odd question. Why, no. I've got two dressing gowns with me, a pink flannel one that's kind of cozy for on board ship, <laughs> and one my daughter gave me as a present, a kind of local affair in purple silk. But what in creation do you want to know about my dressing gowns for? Well, you see, madame, someone in a scarlet kimono entered either your or Mr. Ratchet's compartment last night. It is, as you said just now, very difficult when all the doors are shut to know which compartment is which. Well, no one in a scarlet dressing gown came into my compartment. But then she must have gone into Monsieur Ratchet's. Mrs. Hubbard pursed her lips together and said grimly, Well, that wouldn't surprise me any. Poirot leaned forward. So, you heard a woman's voice next door? Well, I don't know how you guessed that, Mr. Poirot. I don't really. But, uh, well, as a matter of fact... I did. But when I asked you just now if you heard anything next door, you only said you heard Mr. Ratchet snoring. Well, yeah, well, that, that was true enough. He did snore, part of the time. As for the other... Mrs. Hubbard got rather pink. Well, it isn't a very nice thing to speak about. What time was it when you heard a woman's voice? Well, I, I can't tell you. I, I just woke up for a minute and heard a woman talking, and it was plain enough where she was. So I just thought, well, that's the kind of man he is. Well, I'm not surprised. And then I went to sleep again, and I'm sure I should never have mentioned anything of the kind to three strange gentlemen if you hadn't dragged it out of me. Was it before the scare about the man in your compartment or after? Why, that's, that's like what you said just now. He wouldn't have had a woman talking to him if he were dead, would he? Oh, uh, pardon. Pardon. You must think me very stupid, madame. Well, no, I guess even you get kind of muddled now and then. But I just can't get over it being that monster Cassetti. What my daughter will say... Poirot managed adroitly to help the good lady to restore the contents of her handbag, and he then shepherded her towards the door. At the last moment, he said, Oh, you have dropped your handkerchief, madame? Mrs. Hubbard looked at the little scrap of cambric he held out to her. No, that's not mine, Mr. Poirot. I've got mine right here. Oh, pardon. I thought as it had the initial H on it. Well, now that's curious, but it certainly is not mine. Mine are marked C-M-H. And they're sensible things. Not expensive Paris falals. Now what good is a handkerchief like that to anybody's nose? Neither of the three men seemed to have an answer to this question, and Mrs. Hubbard sailed out triumphantly. Chapter 5. The Evidence of the Swedish Lady Monsieur Bouc was handling the button Mrs. Hubbard had left behind her. This button, I, I cannot understand it. Does it mean that, after all, Pierre Michel is involved in some way? He said. He paused, then continued, as Poirot did not reply. But what have you to say, my friend? Mm, that button, it suggests possibilities, said Poirot thoughtfully. 
Let us interview next the Swedish lady before we discuss the evidence we have heard. He sorted through the pile of passports in front of him. Ah, here we are. Greta Olsen, age 49. Monsieur Bouc gave directions to the restaurant attendant, and presently the lady with the yellowish-grey bun of hair and the long, mild, sheep-like face was ushered in. She peered short-sightedly at Poirot through her glasses, but was quite calm. It transpired that she understood and spoke French, so that the conversation took place in that language. Poirot first asked her the questions to which he already knew the answers, her name, age and address. He then asked her her occupation. She was, she told him, matron in a missionary school near Stamboul, and she was a trained nurse. You know, of course, of what took place last night, mademoiselle. Naturally. It is very dreadful. And the American lady tells me that the murderer was actually in her compartment. I heard, mademoiselle, that you were the last person to see the murdered man alive. Well, I do not know. It may be so. I opened the door of his compartment by mistake. I was much ashamed. It was a most awkward mistake. Oh, you actually saw him? Yes. He was reading a book. I apologized quickly and withdrew. And did he say anything to you? A slight flush showed on the worthy lady's cheek. He laughed and said a few words. I, I did not quite catch them. And what did you do after that, mademoiselle? asked Poirot, passing from the subject tactfully. I went in to the American lady, Mrs. Hubbard. I asked her for some aspirin, and she gave it to me. And did she ask you whether the communicating door between her compartment and that of Monsieur Ratchet was bolted? Yes. And was it? Yes. And after that? Well, after that, I go back to my own compartment. I take the aspirin and lie down. And what time was all this? When I got into bed, it was five minutes to eleven, because I look at my watch before I wind it up. Did you go to sleep quickly? Uh, not very quickly. My head got better, but I lay awake some time. Had the train come to a stop before you went to sleep? I do not think so. We stopped, I think, at a station just as I was getting drowsy. Ah, yes, well, that would be Vinkovsky. Now, your compartment, mademoiselle, is this one? He indicated it on the plan. Uh, that is so, yes. And you had the upper or the lower berth? The lower berth, number ten. And you had a companion? Yes. A young English lady, very nice, very amiable. She had travelled from Baghdad. Now, after the train left Vinkovki, did she leave the compartment? No. I'm sure she did not. Well, why are you sure if you were asleep? I sleep very lightly. I'm used to waking at a sound. I'm sure if she had come down from the berth above, I should have awakened. And did you yourself leave the compartment? Not until this morning. Have you a scarlet silk kimono, mademoiselle? No, indeed. I have a good, comfortable dressing gown of Jaeger material. And the lady with you, Miss Debenham? What colour is her dressing gown? A pale mauve abba, such as you buy in the East. Poirot nodded, and then he said in a friendly tone, Why are you taking this journey? A holiday? Yes, I'm going home for a holiday. But first I go to Lausanne to stay with a sister for a week or so. Ah, well, perhaps you will be so amiable as to write me down the name and address of your sister. With pleasure. She took the paper and pencil he gave her and wrote down the name and address as requested. Have you ever been in America, mademoiselle? No, but very nearly once. I was to go with an invalid lady, but it was cancelled at the last moment. Oh, I much regret it. They're very good, the Americans. They give much money to found schools and hospitals. They are very practical. Now, do you remember hearing of the Armstrong kidnapping case? No. What was that? Poirot explained. Greta Olsen was indignant. Her yellow bun of hair quivered with her emotion. <gasps> that there are in the world such evil men... It tries one's faith. Oh, the poor mother. <laughs> My heart aches for her. The amiable Swede departed. Her kindly face flushed, her eyes suffused with tears.
Faro was writing busily on a sheet of paper. Uh, what is it that you write there, my friend? asked Monsieur Bouc. Ah, mon cher, it is my habit to be neat and orderly. I make here a little table of chronological events. He finished writing and passed the paper to Monsieur Bouc. Nine fifteen. Train leaves Belgrade. About nine forty, valet leaves Ratchet with sleeping draught beside him. About ten o'clock, McQueen leaves Ratchet. About ten forty, Greta Olsen sees Ratchet, in brackets, last seen alive. Nota bene, he was awake reading a book. Ten past midnight, train leaves Vinkovki, in brackets, late. Twelve thirty a.m., train runs into a snowdrift. Thirty-seven minutes past twelve, Ratchet's bell rings. Conductor answers it. Ratchet says, "Ce n'est rien. Je me suis trompé." About one seventeen a.m., Mrs. Hubbard thinks man is in her carriage. Rings for conductor. Monsieur Bouc nodded approval. Well, that is very clear, he said. But there is nothing there that strikes you as at all odd. No, no. It's it seems all quite clear and above board. It seems quite plain that the crime was committed at one fifteen. The, the evidence of the watch shows us that, and Mrs. Abbott's story fits in. No, from my mind, I will make a guess at the identity of the murderer. I say, my friend, that it is the big Italian. <laughs> he comes from America, from Chicago, and remember, an Italian's weapon is the knife, and he stabs not once but several times. Ah, oui, no, yes, that is true. Without a doubt, that is the solution of the mystery. Doubtless he and this Ratchet were in this kidnapping business together. Cassetti is an Italian name. <laughs> in some way, Ratchet did on him what they call the double cross. The Italian tracks him down, sends him warning letters first, and finally revenges himself upon him in a brutal way. It is all quite simple. Poirot shook his head doubtfully. Well, it is hardly as simple as that. I fear, he murmured. Me? No, I am convinced it is the truth," said Monsieur Bouc, becoming more and more enamoured of his theory. And what about the valet with the toothache who swears that the Italian never left the compartment? Ah, that is the difficulty.、Hmm. Poirot twinkled. Yes, it is annoying that. Hmm. And lucky for your theory, and extremely lucky for our Italian friend that Monsieur Ratchet's valet should have had the toothache. But it will be explained," said Monsieur Bouc with magnificent certainty. Poirot shook his head again. "No, it is hardly so simple as that," he murmured again. Chapter Six: The Evidence of the Russian Princess. Let us hear what Pierre Michel has to say about this baton," he said. The wagon lee conductor was recalled. He looked at them inquiringly. Monsieur Bouc cleared his throat. <coughs> Michel, he said, "Here is a button from your tunic. It was found in the American lady's compartment. What have you to say for yourself about it?" The conductor's hand went automatically to his tunic.、Ah, "I have lost no button, Monsieur," he said. "There must be some mistake." "Well, that is very odd." "I cannot account for it, Monsieur." The man seemed astonished, but not in any way guilty or confused. Monsieur Bouc said meaningly, "Owing to the circumstances in which it was found, it seems fairly certain that this baton was dropped by the man who was in Mrs. Abbott's compartment last night when she rang the bell." But Monsieur, there was no one there. The lady must have imagined it. She did not imagine it, Michel. The assassin of Monsieur Ratchet passed that way. And dropped that baton. As the significance of Monsieur Bouc's word became plain to him, Pierre Michel flew into a violent state of agitation. <gasps> no, he, it is not true, Monsieur. It is not true. He cried, "You are accusing me of the crime. Me? No, I am innocent. I am absolutely innocent. Why should I want to kill a Monsieur whom I have never seen before?" Where were you when Mrs. Abbott's bell rang? I told you, Monsieur, in the next coach, talking to my colleague. We will send for him. Do so, Monsieur. I implore you, do so. The conductor of the next coach was summoned. He immediately confirmed Pierre Michel's statement. 
He added that the conductor from the Bucharest coach had also been there. The three of them had been discussing the situation caused by the snow. They had been talking some ten minutes when Michel fancied he heard a bell. As he opened the doors connecting the two coaches, they had all heard it plainly. A bell ringing repeatedly. Michel had run post haste to answer it. So you see, Monsieur, I am not guilty," cried Michel anxiously. When this button from a wagon leaked unique, how do you explain it? I cannot, Monsieur. It is a mystery to me. All my buttons are intact. Both of the other conductors also declared that they had not lost a button, also that they had not been inside Mrs. Hubbard's compartment at any time. Calm yourself, Michel," said Monsieur Bouc, "and cast your mind back to the moment when you ran to answer Mrs. Hubbard's bell. Did you meet anyone at all in the corridor? No, Monsieur." Uh, did you see anyone going away from you down the corridor in the other direction? Again, no, Monsieur. Odd," said Monsieur Bouc. "Ah,、uh, not so very," said Poirot. "It is a question of time. Mrs. Abbott wakes to find someone in her compartment. For a minute or two, she lies paralyzed, her eyes shut. Probably it was then that the man slipped out into the corridor. Then." She starts ringing the bell, but the conductor does not come at once. It is only the third or fourth peal that he hears. I should say myself that there was ample time. For what? For what, mon cher? Remember that there are thick drifts of snow all around the train.、Ah, there are two courses open to a mysterious assassin," said Poirot slowly. He could retreat into either of the toilettes. Or he could disappear into one of the compartments. But they were all occupied. Yes. You mean that he could retreat into his own compartment? Poirot nodded.、Mm, it fits. It fits. Murmured Monsieur Bouc. During that ten minutes absence of the conductor, the murderer comes from his own compartment, goes into Ratchet's, kills him, locks and chains the door. On the inside, goes out through Mrs. Abbott's compartment and is back safely in his own compartment by the time the conductor arrives. Poirot murmured, <laughs> "It is not quite so simple as that, my friend. Our friend the doctor here will tell you so." With a gesture, Monsieur Bouc signified that the three conductors might depart. "We have still to see eight passengers," said Poirot. Five first-class passengers: Princess Dragomirov, Count and Countess Andreigny, Colonel Abathnot, and. Mr. Hartman, and three second-class passengers: Miss Debenham, Antonio Fascarella, and the lady's maid, Fraulein Schmidt. Well, who will you see first? The Italian, huh? <sighs> How you harp on your Italian, huh? No, we will start at the top of the tree. Perhaps Madame la Princesse will be so good as to spare us a few moments of her time. Convey that message to her, Michel. We,、oui, Monsieur. Said the conductor, who was just leaving the car. We can wait on her in her compartment if she does not wish to put herself to the trouble of coming here," called Monsieur Bouc. But Princess Dragomirov declined to take this course. She appeared in the dining car, inclined her head slightly, and sat down opposite Poirot. Her small toad-like face looked even yellower than the day before. She was certainly ugly. And yet, like the toad, she had eyes like jewels, dark and imperious, revealing latent energy and an intellectual force that could be felt at once. Her voice was deep, very distinct, with a slight grating quality in it. She cut short a flowery phrase of apology from Monsieur Bouc. Ah, you need not offer apologies, Monsieur. I understand the murder has taken place. Naturally, you must interview all the passengers. I shall be glad to give all the assistance in my power. Are you almost amiable, Madame? Said Poirot. Not at all. It is my duty. What do you wish to know?、Uh, your full Christian names and address, Madame.、Oh, perhaps you would prefer to write them yourself. Poirot proffered a sheet of paper and pencil, but the princess waved them aside. "You can write it," she said. "There is nothing difficult. 
Natalia Dragomirov, 17 Avenue, Kleber, Paris. Are you are travelling home from Constantinople, madame? Yes, I have been staying at the Austrian embassy. My maid is with me. And would you be so good as to give me a brief account of your movements last night from dinner onwards? Willingly. I directed the conductor to make up my bed whilst I was in the dining car. I retired to bed immediately after dinner. I read until the hour of eleven when I turned out my light. I was unable to sleep owing to certain rheumatic pains from which I suffer. At about a quarter to one, I rang for my maid. She massaged me and then read aloud till I felt sleepy. I cannot say exactly when she left me. It may have been half an hour. It may have been later. Uh, the train had stopped then. The train had stopped. And you heard nothing, nothing unusual during that time, madame? I heard nothing unusual. What is your maid's name? Hildegard Schmidt. Has she been with you long? Fifteen years. And you consider her trustworthy? Absolutely. Her people come from an estate of my late husband's in Germany. You have been in America, I presume, madame? The abrupt change of subject made the old lady raise her eyebrows. Many times. And were you at any time acquainted with a family of the name of Armstrong, a family in which a tragedy occurred? With some emotion in her voice, the old lady said, You speak of friends of mine, monsieur. Oh, you knew Colonel Armstrong well, then? I knew him slightly. But his wife, Sonia Armstrong, was my goddaughter. I was on terms of friendship with her mother, the actress, Linda Arden. Linda Arden was a great genius, one of the greatest tragic actresses in the world. As Lady Macbeth, as Magda, there was no one to touch her. I was not only an admirer of her art, I was a personal friend. She is dead? No, no, she is alive, but she lives in complete retirement. Her health is very delicate. She has to lie on a sofa most of the time. And there was, I think, her second daughter? Yes, much younger than Mrs. Armstrong. And she is alive? Certainly. And where is she? The old woman bent an acute glance at him. I must ask you the reason of these questions. What have they to do with the matter in hand? The murder on this train? They are connected in this way, madame. The man who was murdered was the man responsible for the kidnapping and murder of Mrs. Armstrong's child. Huh? The straight brows drew together. Princess Dragomirov drew herself a little more erect. In my view, then, this murder is an entirely admirable happening. You will pardon my slightly biased point of view. Oh, no, it is most natural, madame. And now, to return to the question you did not answer, where is the younger daughter of Linda Arden, the sister of Mrs. Armstrong? I honestly cannot tell you, monsieur. I have lost touch with the younger generation. I believe she married an Englishman some ten years ago and went to England, but at the moment I cannot recollect the name. She paused a minute and then said, Is there anything further you want to ask me, gentlemen? Only one thing, madame. A somewhat personal question. The colour of your dressing gown. She raised her eyebrows slightly. I must suppose you have a reason for such a question. My dressing gown is of blue satin. Ah, there is nothing more, madame. I am much obliged to you for answering my question so promptly. She made a slight gesture with her heavily beringed hand. 
Then, as she rose and the others rose with her, she stopped. You will excuse me, monsieur, she said, but may I ask your name? Your face is somehow familiar to me. My name, madame, is Hercule Poirot at your service. She was silent a minute. Then, Hercule Poirot, she said. Yes, I remember now. This is destiny. She walked away very erect, a little stiff in her movements. <sighs> oh, voilà une grande dame, said Monsieur Bouc. What do you think of her, my friend? Huh? But Hercule Poirot merely shook his head. I am wondering, he said, what she meant by destiny. Chapter Seven: The Evidence of Count and Countess Andrenyi. Count and Countess Andrenyi were next summoned. The Count, however, entered the dining car alone. There was no doubt that he was a fine-looking man seen face to face. He was at least six feet in height, with broad shoulders and slender hips. He was dressed in very well-cut English tweeds and might have been taken for an Englishman had it not been for the length of his moustache and something in the line of the cheekbone. Well, Monsieur, he said, what can I do for you? You understand, Monsieur, said Poirot, that in view of what has occurred, I am obliged to put certain questions to all the passengers. Perfectly, perfectly," said the count easily. "I quite understand your position. Not, I fear, that my wife and I can do much to assist you. We were asleep and heard nothing at all. Are you aware of the identity of the deceased, Monsieur? I understand it was the big American, a man with a decidedly unpleasant face. He sat at that table at meal times. He indicated with a nod of his head the table at which Ratchet and McQueen had sat. Ah,、oh, yes, yes, Monsieur, you are perfectly correct. <laughs> I meant, did you know the name of the man? No. The Count looked thoroughly puzzled by Poirot's queries. If you want to know his name, he said, surely it is on his passport. Ah, but the name on his passport is Ratchet, said Poirot. But that Monsieur is not his real name. He is the man Cassetti, who was responsible for a celebrated kidnapping outrage in America. He watched the Count closely as he spoke, but the latter seemed quite unaffected by the piece of news. He merely opened his eyes a little. Ah, he said,、uh, so、that certainly should throw light upon the matter. An extraordinary country, America. You have been there, perhaps, Monsieur Le Comte. I was in Washington for a year. You knew perhaps the Armstrong family. Armstrong, Armstrong.、Mm, it is difficult to recall. One met so many. He smiled and shrugged his shoulders. But to come back to the matter in hand, gentlemen, he said, what more can I do to assist you? You're retired to rest when, Monsieur le Comte. Hercule Poirot's eyes stole to his plan. Count and Countess Andrenyi occupied compartments number twelve and thirteen adjoining. We had one compartment made up for the night whilst we were in the dining car. On returning, we sat in the other for a while. Ah, and what number would that be? Number thirteen. We played piquet together. About eleven o'clock, my wife. Retired for the night, the conductor made up my compartment, and I also went to bed. I slept soundly until morning. Did you notice the stopping of the train? I was not aware of it until this morning. And your wife? The count smiled. My wife always takes a sleeping draught when travelling by train. She took her usual dose of trionel. He paused. I am sorry I am not able to assist you in any way. Poirot passed him a sheet of paper and a pen. Oh, thank you, Monsieur le Comte. It is a formality, but will you just let me have your name and address? 
The Count wrote slowly and carefully. Hmm, it is just as well I should write this for you, he said pleasantly. The spelling of my country estate is a little difficult for those unacquainted with the language. He passed the paper across to Poirot and rose. It will be quite unnecessary for my wife to come here, he said. She can tell you nothing more than I have. A little gleam came into Poirot's eye. Oh, Douglas, Douglas, he said. But all the same, I think I should like to have just one little word with Madame la Comtesse. I assure you it is quite unnecessary. His voice rang out authoritatively. Poirot blinked gently at him. It will be a mere formality, he said. But you understand it is necessary for my report. Mm, as you please. The Count gave way grudgingly. He made a short foreign bow and left the dining car. Poirot reached out a hand to a passport. It set out the Count's name and titles. He passed on to the further information, accompanied by wife. Christian name, Elena Maria. Maiden name, Goldenberg. Age, twenty. A spot of grease had been dropped some time by a careless official on it. <sighs> a diplomatic passport, said Monsieur Bouc. We must be careful, my friend, to give no offence. These people can have nothing to do with the murder, huh? Be easy, mon vieux. I will be most tactful. A mere formality? His voice dropped as the Countess Andrenyi entered the dining car. She looked timid and extremely charming. You wish to see me, monsieur? A mere formality, Madame la Comtesse. Poirot rose gallantly, bowed her into the seat opposite him. It is only to ask you if you saw or heard anything last night that may throw light upon this matter. Nothing at all, monsieur. I was asleep. And you did not hear, for instance, a commotion going on in the compartment next to yours? <laughs> the American lady who occupies it had quite an attack of hysterics and rang for the conductor. Hmm. I heard nothing, monsieur. You see, I had taken a sleeping draught. Ah! I comprehend. Well, I need not detain you further. Then, as she rose swiftly, oh, just one little minute. These particulars, your maiden name, age, and so on, they are correct? Oh, quite correct, monsieur. And perhaps you will sign this memorandum to that effect, then. She signed quickly, a graceful, slanting handwriting. Elena Andrenyi. Hmm. Did you accompany your husband to America, madame? Uh, no, monsieur. She smiled, flushed a little. We were not married then. We have only been married a year. Ah, yes, thank you, madame. Oh, by the way, does your husband smoke? She stared at him as she stood poised for departure. Yes. Oh, a pipe? No. Cigarettes and cigars. Ah, thank you. She lingered. Her eyes watched him curiously. Lovely eyes they were, dark and almond-shaped, with very long black lashes that swept the exquisite pallor of her cheeks. Her lips, very scarlet, in the foreign fashion, were parted just a little. She looked exotic and beautiful. Why did you ask me that? Ah, oh, madame, Poirot waved an airy hand. Detectives have to ask all sorts of questions. <laughs> For instance, perhaps you will tell me the color of your dressing gown. She stared at him. Then she laughed. <laughs> it is corn-colored chiffon. Is that really important? Ah, oh, very important, madame. She asked curiously, Are you really a detective, then? At your service, madame. I thought there were no detectives on the train when it passed through Yugoslavia. Not until one got to Italy. Ah, oh, but I am not a Yugoslavian detective, madame. I am an international detective. Oh, you belong to the League of Nations? I belong to the world, madame, said Poirot dramatically. He went on. I work mainly in London. You speak English? He added in that language. 
I speak a little yes. Her accent was charming. Poirot bowed once more. Why we will not detain you further, Madame? You see, it was not so very terrible. She smiled, inclined her head, and departed. Elle est jolie femme," said Monsieur Bouc appreciatively. He sighed. <gasps> well, that did not advance us much. No," said Poirot. Two people who saw nothing and heard nothing. Shall we now see the Italian? Huh? Poirot did not reply for a moment. He was studying a grease spot on a Hungarian diplomatic passport. Chapter Eight: The Evidence of Colonel Arbuthnot. Poirot roused himself with a slight start. His eyes twinkled a little as they met the eager ones of Monsieur Bouc. Ah, my dear old friend, he said. You see, I have become what they call the snob. The first class, I feel it, should be attended to before the second class. Next, I think we will interview the good-looking Colonel Abathnot. Finding the Colonel's French to be of a severely limited description, Poirot conducted his interrogation in English. Abathnot's name, age, home address, and exact military standing were all ascertained. Poirot proceeded. It is that you come on from India on what is called the leave, what we call en permission. Colonel Abathnot, uninterested in what a pack of foreigners call anything, replied with true British brevity, "Yes." Oh, <clears throat> but you do not come home on the P and O boat. No. Ah, oh, <clears throat> well, um, why not? I chose to come by the overland route, for reasons of my own. And that, his manner seemed to say, is one for you, you interfering little jackanapes.、Uh, you came straight through from India, the Colonel replied dryly. I stopped for one night to see Ur of the Chaldees, and for three days in Baghdad with the AOC, who happens to be an old friend of mine. Ah, you stopped three days in Baghdad. I understand that the young English lady, Miss Debenham, also comes from Baghdad. <laughs> Perhaps you met her there? No, I did not. I first met Miss Debenham when she and I shared the railway convoy car from Kirkuk to Nisibin. Poirot leaned forward. He became persuasive and a little more foreign than he need have been. Monsieur, I am about to appeal to you. You and Miss Debenham are the only two English people on the train. It is necessary that I should ask you each your opinion of the other. Highly irregular," said Colonel Abathnot coldly. "Oh, not so. You see, this crime—it was most probably committed by a woman. The man was stabbed no less than twelve times. Even the chef de train said at once it is a woman. Well then, what is my first task? To give all the women travelling on the Stamboul Calais coach." What Americans call the once over, but to judge of an English woman, <laughs> it's difficult. They are very reserved, the English. So I appeal to you, Monsieur, in the interests of justice. What sort of a person is this Miss Debenham? What do you know about her? Miss Debenham, said the Colonel with some warmth, is a lady. Ah, said Poirot, with every appearance of being much gratified. So you do not think that she is likely to be implicated in this crime? <laughs> the idea is absurd," said Arbuthnot. "The man was a perfect stranger; she had never seen him before. And did she tell you so? She did. She commented at once upon his somewhat unpleasant appearance. Now, if a woman is concerned, as you seem to think, and to my mind, without any evidence but mere assumption. I can assure you that Miss Debenham could not possibly be indicated. Do you feel warmly in the matter? Said Poirot with a smile. Colonel Abathnot gave him a cold stare. I really don't know what you mean," he said. The stare seemed to abash Poirot. He dropped his eyes and began fiddling with the papers in front of him. Oh, but all this is by the way," he said. "Let us be practical and come to the facts. This crime, we have reason to believe, took place at a quarter past one last night." It is part of the necessary routine to ask everyone on the train what he or she was doing at that time. Yes, quite so. At a quarter past one, to the best of my belief, I was talking to the young American fellow as, you know, as secretary to the dead man. 
Ah, you were in his compartment, or was he in yours? I was in his. And that is the young man of the name McQueen? Yes, he was a friend or acquaintance of yours. No, I never saw him before this journey. We fell into casual conversation yesterday and both became interested. I don't, as a rule, like Americans. Haven't any use for them. Poirot smiled, remembering McQueen's strictures on Britishers. Yeah, but I liked this young fellow. He'd got hold of some tomfool idiotic ideas about the situation in India. Yes, that's the worst of Americans. They're so sentimental and idealistic. Well, he was interested in what I had to tell him. I've had nearly thirty years' experience of the country, and I was interested in what he had to tell me about the financial situation in America. And then we got down to world politics in general. I was quite surprised to look at my watch and find it was a、uh, quarter to two. And that is the time you broke up this conversation. Yes. And what did you do then? Walked along to my own compartment and turned in. Your bed was made up ready. Yes. And that is the compartment. Let me see.、Uh, ah, number fifteen, the one next but one to the end.、Uh, that's、uh, away from the dining car.、Hmm? Yes. Where was the conductor when you went to your compartment? We were sitting at the end of the little table. As a matter of fact, McQueen called him just as I went to my own compartment. Oh, why did he call him? Well, to make up his bed, I suppose. The compartment hadn't been made up for the night. Now, Colonel Abathnot, I want you to think carefully. During the time you were talking to Monsieur McQueen, did anyone pass along the corridor outside the door? Well, a good many people, I should think. I wasn't paying attention. Ah, no. But I am referring to, let us say, the last hour and a half of your conversation. You got out at Vinkovki, didn't you? Yes, but only for about a minute. There was a blizzard on. The cold was something frightful. Made one quite thankful to get back to the fog. There was a rule. I think the way these trains are overheated is something scandalous. Monsieur Bouc sighed. Well, it, it is very difficult to please everybody, he said. The English, they open everything. Then others, they come along and shut everything. It is very difficult. Neither Poirot nor Colonel Labath not paid any attention to him. Now, Monsieur, cast your mind back," said Poirot encouragingly. It was cold outside. You have returned to the train. You sit down again. You smoke, oh, perhaps a cigarette, perhaps a pipe. He paused for the fraction of a second. No,、yes, pipe for me. McQueen smoked cigarettes. And then the train starts again. You smoke your pipe. You discuss the state of Europe, of the world. It is late now. Most people have retired for the night. Does anyone pass the door? Think,、hmm? Arbuthnot frowned in the effort of remembrance. Ah, difficult to say, he said. You see, well, I wasn't paying any attention. But you had the soldier's observation for detail, eh?、Huh? <laughs> you notice without noticing, so to speak. The colonel thought again, but shook his head. No, I, no, I couldn't say. I don't remember anyone passing except the conductor. Oh, wait a minute! And there was a woman, I think. Oh, you saw her? Was she old, young? No, I didn't see her. Wasn't looking that way. Just a rustle and a, a sort of smell of scent. Scent? A good scent? Well. Rather fruity, if you know what I mean. I mean, well, you'd smell it a hundred yards away, mind you. The colonel went on hastily. This may have been earlier in the evening. You see, as you said just now, it it was just one of those things you notice without noticing, so to speak. Sometime that evening, I said to myself, "Woman, scent, got it on pretty thick." But when it was, I can't be sure. Except that, oh, well, well, why, yes, it it must have been after Vinkovsky. Why? Because I remember sniffing, you know, just when I was talking about the utter washout, Stalin's five-year plan was turning out. I know the idea. Woman brought the idea of the position of women in Russia into my mind, and I know we hadn't got onto Russia until pretty near the end of our talk. And you can't pin it down more definitely than that. Uh, no, no, it must have been roughly within the last half hour. It was after the train had stopped. The other nodded. Oh yes, I'm. Oh yes, I'm almost sure it was. Well, we will pass from that. Have you ever been in America, Colonel Abathnot? Well, never.
and don't want to go. Did you ever know a Colonel Armstrong? Armstrong, Armstrong. Um, well, I've, I've known two or three Armstrongs. There was Tommy Armstrong in the sixtieth. You don't mean him? Uh, and Selby Armstrong? Well, no, he, he was killed on Somme. No, 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 no. I mean the Colonel Armstrong who married an American wife and whose only child was kidnapped and killed. Ah, uh, yes, I remember reading about that shocking affair. No, I don't think I actually ever came across the fellow, though of course I knew of him. Toby Armstrong, nice fellow. Everybody liked him. He had a very distinguished career. Got the VC. Well, the man who was killed last night was the man responsible for the murder of Colonel Armstrong's child. Arbuthnot's face grew rather grim. Well, then, in my opinion, the swine deserved what he got. Though I would have preferred to have seen him properly hanged or electrocuted, I suppose, over there. Well, in fact, Colonel Arbuthnot, you prefer law and order to private vengeance. Well, you can't go about having blood feuds and stabbing each other like Corsicans or the Mafia," said the Colonel. "Well, say what you like. Trial by jury is a sound system." Poirot looked at him thoughtfully for a minute or two. "Oh yes," he said. "I am sure that would be your view." Well, Colonel Lapartnot, I do not think there is anything more I have to ask you. There is nothing you yourself can recall last night that in any way struck you, or shall we say, strikes you now, looking back as suspicious. Arbuthnot considered for a moment or two. No, he said, nothing at all. Unless he hesitated. But yes, continue. I pray of you. Well, no, it's nothing really," said the Colonel slowly. But you said anything. Well, yes, yes. Go on. Well, well, it's nothing. I have mere detail. But, but as I got back to my compartment, I noticed that the door of the one beyond mine, uh, the end one, you know. Uh, yes, number sixteen. Well, the door of it was not quite closed, and the fellow inside peered out in a furtive sort of way, and then he pulled the door to quickly. Of course, I well, I know there's nothing in that, but it just struck me as a bit odd. I mean, it's quite usual to open a door and stick your head out if you want to see anything, but it was it was the furtive way he did it that caught my attention. Y uh, yes, said Poirot doubtfully. Well, I, I told you there was nothing to it," said Arbuthnot apologetically. "But you know what it is. Early hours of the morning, everything still. The thing had a sinister look, <laughs> like a detective story. All nonsense, really." He rose. "Well, if you don't want me any more, oh, thank you, Colonel Arbuthnot. There is nothing else." The soldier hesitated for a minute. His first natural distaste for being questioned by foreigners had evaporated. Look about,、uh, Miss Debenham," he said rather awkwardly. "You can take it from me that she's all right. She's a pucker sab." Flushing a little, he withdrew. "What?" asked Doctor Constantine with interest. "Does a pucker sab mean?" "It means," said Poirot, "that Miss Debenham's father and brothers were at the same kind of school as Colonel Arbuthnot." "Oh." Said Doctor Constantine, disappointed. Then it has nothing to do with the crime at all. Exactly," said Poirot. He fell into a reverie, beating a light tattoo on the table. Then he looked up. Colonel Abbasnot smokes a pipe," he said. "In the compartment of Monsieur Rachet, I found a pipe cleaner. Monsieur Rachet smoked only cigars. You think?" Oh, he is the only man so far who admits to smoking a pipe, and he knew of Colonel Armstrong. Perhaps actually did know him, though he won't admit it.、Hmm? So you think it's possible? Poirot shook his head violently.、Ah, that is just it. It is impossible, quite impossible, that an honourable, slightly stupid, upright Englishman should stab an enemy twelve times with a knife. Do you not feel, my friends, how impossible it is? Hmm. But that is the psychology," said Monsieur Bouc.、Hmm. "And one must respect the psychology. This crime has a signature, and it is certainly not the signature of Colonel Abathnot. But now to our next interview." This time, Monsieur Bouc did not mention the Italian, but he thought of him. Chapter Nine. 
The last of the first-class passengers to be interviewed, Mr. Hardman, was the big flamboyant American who had shared a table with the Italian and the valet. He wore a somewhat loud check suit, a pink shirt, a flashy tie pin, and was rolling something round his tongue as he entered the dining car. He had a big, fleshy, coarse-featured face with a good-humoured expression. "Morning, gentlemen," he said. "What can I do for you?" You have heard of this murder, Mister、um, Hartman? Yeah, sure. He shifted the chewing gum deftly. Now we are of necessity interviewing all the passengers on the train. Yeah, well, that's all right by me. Guess that's the only way to tackle the job.、Hmm? Poirot consulted the passport lying in front of him. Now you are Cyrus Bethman Hartman. United States subject, forty-one years of age, traveling salesman for typewriting ribbons. Okay, that's me. <laughs> And you are traveling from Istanbul to Paris. That's all. Reason? Yeah, business. You always travel first class, Mr. Hartman. Ah, yes, sir. Well, the firm pays my traveling expenses. <laughs> He winked. Now, Mr. Hartman, we come to the events of last night. The American nodded. Now, what can you tell us about the matter? Ah,、oh, exactly nothing at all. Ah, that is a pity. Perhaps, Mr. Hartman, you will tell us exactly what you did last night from dinner onwards. For the first time, the American did not seem ready with his reply. At last, he said, "Excuse me, gentlemen, but just who are you? You know, put me wise." Ah, but this is Monsieur Bouc, the director of the company des Wagons-Lits.、Uh, this gentleman is the doctor who examined the body. And you yourself? I am Hercule Poirot. I am engaged by the company to investigate this matter. Ah, I've heard of you," said Mr. Harpen. He reflected a minute or two longer. Guess I'd better come clean. Well, it will certainly be advisable for you to tell us all you know," said Poirot dryly. "Why, you'd have said a mouthful if there was anything I did know, but I don't. I know nothing at all, just as I said. But I ought to know something, and that's what makes me sore. I ought to know. Well, please explain, Mister Hardman." Mister Hardman sighed, removed the chewing gum. And dived into a pocket. At the same time, his whole personality seemed to undergo a change. He became less of a stage character and more of a real person. The resonant nasal tones of his voice became modified.、Uh, that passport's a bit of a bluff," he said. "That's who I really am." Poirot scrutinized the card flipped across to him. Monsieur Bouc peered over his shoulder. Mister Cyrus B. Hardman, McNeil's Detective Agency, New York. Poirot knew the name. It was one of the best-known and most reputable private detective agencies in New York. Well, now, Mister Hardman, he said, let us hear the meaning of this. Sure. Well, things came about this way. I'd come over to Europe trailing a couple of crooks. No, nothing to do with this business. The chase ended in Istanbul. I wired the chief and got his instructions to return, and well, I would have been making my tracks back to little old New York when I got this. He pushed across a letter. The heading at the top was the Tocatlian Hotel. Dear sir, you have been pointed out to me as an operative of the McNeil Detective Agency. Kindly report to my suite at four o'clock this afternoon. It was signed S. E. Ratchet. Eh bien. Well, I reported at the time stated, and Mr. Ratchet put me wise to the situation. He showed me a couple of letters he'd got, and was he alarmed? <laughs> Pretended not to be, but he was rattled, all right. He put a proposition to me: I was to travel by the same train as he did to Paris and see that nobody got him. Well, gentlemen, I did travel by the same train, and in spite of me, somebody did get him. I certainly feel sore about it. It doesn't look any too good for me. Did he give you any indication of the line you were to take? Sure, he had it all taped out. It was his idea that I should travel in the compartment alongside his. Well, <laughs> that was blown upon straight away. The only place I could get was berth number sixteen, and I had a bit of a job getting that. 
I guess the conductor likes to keep that compartment up his sleeve. But that's neither here nor there. When I looked all around the situation, it seemed to me that number 16 was a pretty good strategic position. There was only the dining car in front of the Stamboul sleeping car. The door onto the platform at the front end was barred at night. The only way a thug could come was through the rear end door to the platform or along the train from the rear. In either case, he'd have to pass right by my compartment. So you had no idea, I suppose, of the identity of the possible assailant? Well, I knew what he looked like. Mr. Ratchet described him to me. Well, what? All three men leaned forward eagerly. Hardman went on. A small man, dark with a womanish kind of voice. That's what the old man said. Said, too, that he didn't think it would be the first night out, more likely the second or third. Oh, he knew something, said Monsieur Bouc. Mm. Well, he certainly knew more than he told his secretary, said Poirot thoughtfully. Did he tell you anything about this enemy of his? Did he, for instance, say why his life was threatened? No, he was kind of reticent about that part of it. Just said the fellow was out for his blood and meant to get it. Mm. A small man, dark, with a womanish voice, mm, said Poirot thoughtfully. Then, fixing a sharp glance on Hardman, he said, You know... Who he really was, of course. Which, mister? Ratchet? You recognized him? I'm sorry, I don't get you. Ratchet was Cassetti? The Armstrong murderer? Mr. Hardman gave way to a prolonged whistle. <whistles> wow, that certainly is some surprise, he said. Yes, sir. No, I, I didn't recognize him. I was away out west when that case came in. I, well, I suppose I saw photos of him in the papers, but I, I wouldn't recognize my own mother when a press photographer had done with her. Well, I don't doubt that a few people had it in for Cassetti, all right. And do you know of anyone connected with the Armstrong case who answers to that description? Small, dark, womanish voice? Harbin reflected a minute or two. Well, it's hard to say. Pretty nearly everyone to do with that case is dead. There was the girl who threw herself out of the window, remember? Ah, uh, yeah, sure. That's a good point, that. She was a foreigner of some kind. Well, maybe she had some WAP relations, huh? But you got to remember that there were other cases besides the Armstrong case. Cassetti had been running this kidnapping stunt some time. You can't concentrate on that only. Ah, no, but, but we have reason to believe that this crime is connected with the Armstrong case. Mr. Hardman cocked an inquiring eye. Poirot did not respond. The American shook his head. I can't call to mind anybody answering that description in the Armstrong case, he said slowly. But, of course, I wasn't in it and didn't know much about it. Well, continue your narrative, Mr. Hardman. Well, there's very little to tell. I got my sleep in the daytime and stayed awake on the watch all night. Nothing serious happened the first night, and last night was the same, as far as I was concerned. I had my door a little ajar and watched. No stranger passed. And you are sure of that, Monsieur Hardman? I'm plumb certain. Nobody got on that train from outside, and nobody came along the train from the rear carriages. I'll take my oath on that. Could you see the conductor from your position? Sure. He sits on that little seat almost flush with my door. Uh, did he leave that seat at all after the train stopped at Vinkovki? Well, now, that was the last station? Why, yes, he answered a couple of bells. Now, that would be just after the train came to a halt for good. And then after that, he went past me into the rear coach, was there about a quarter of an hour. There was a bell ringing like mad, and he came running back. I stepped out of the corridor to see what it was all about. Felt a mite nervous, you understand, but it was, it was only the American dame. She was raising hell about something or other. I grinned. And then he went on to another compartment and came back and got a bottle of mineral water for someone. And after that, he settled down in his seat till he went up to the far end to make somebody's bed up. Now, I don't think he stirred after that until about five o'clock this morning. And did he doze off at all? Well, that I can't say. He may have done. Poirot nodded. Automatically, his hands straightened the papers on the table. He picked up the official card once more. A be so good... As just to initial this, he said. The other complied. Now, there is no one, I suppose, who can confirm your story of your identity, Monsieur Hardman. Ah, uh, well, on this train? Well, not exactly. Unless it might be young McQueen. I know him well enough, seen him in his father's office in New York. 
But that's not to say you'll remember me from a crowd of other operatives. No, Mr. Poirot, you'll have to wait in Cable, New York, when the snow lets up. But it's okay. I'm not telling a tale, you know. Well, so long, gentlemen. Pleased to have met you, Mr. Poirot. Poirot proffered his cigarette case. Oh, but perhaps you prefer a pipe? Not, not me. He helped himself, then strode briskly off. The three men looked at each other. You think he is genuine? asked Dr. Constantine. Oh, yes, yes, I know the type. Mm. Besides, it is a story that would be very easily disproved. Yeah, but he has given us a piece of very interesting evidence, said Monsieur Bouc. Yes, indeed. A small man, dark, with a high-pitched voice, said Monsieur Bouc thoughtfully. Ah, huh? a description which applies to no one on the train, said Poirot. End of side three.